Hello and welcome to the eighth lecture on William Shakespeare's Hamlet. And today let's turn to Act 3, Scene 3. In your anthologies, I'm on page 1451. This is Act 3, Scene 3. And this is often referred to as the prayer scene by uh, Shakespearean critics and scholars. And it's in this scene that we discover the truth concerning uh, the murder of Hamlet's father. And we learn that yes, Claudius is guilty of the crime. We also discover which of the three scenarios we discussed last lecture, uh, which of those three scenarios is accurate. And it is the third scenario. Claudius flees the stage uh, during the play within the play, the performance that Hamlet is having the actors uh, present. Claudius rushes from the stage, he rises, he calls for lights, and he exits the stage because not only is he guilty of the crime, and the play has indeed caught the conscience of the king, but he also believes that Hamlet is threatening him, that Hamlet is an ambitious man, and that Hamlet wants to uh, ascend to the throne. He wants to wrest the crown from Claudius's hands. Hamlet wants the power for himself. And so we learn here at the beginning of Act 3, Scene 3, the prayer scene, we learn that, uh, that Claudius indeed believes Hamlet is a menace. Look what he tells Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. I like him not nor stands it safe with us to let his madness reign. So he doesn't trust Hamlet. Hamlet is a threat. Therefore prepare you. I, your commission, will forthwith dispatch, and he to England shall along with you. So Claudius is determined to send Hamlet to England uh, for Claudius's safety. He doesn't uh, trust Hamlet. Hamlet is behaving strangely. And again, Claudius believes that Hamlet wants uh, the throne. He wants to be the king. He wants to rule Denmark. The terms of our estate may not endure hazard so near us. Hamlet is a hazard. And notice the word estate here. It's interesting that Shakespeare uses this word because we recall that uh, in the scene prior, uh, Hamlet uses that very word. Remember the line Hamlet tells Claudius as the play, the play within the play is unfolding. Hamlet tells Claudius that the murderer, he kills him, he kills the, the king, he kills him in his garden for his estate, for the kingship, for the kingdom, for the power. So here is proof that Claudius does feel uh, he is in danger, that Hamlet has threatened him, has threatened to kill him and assume power. Uh, and next we learn at the top of page 1452, <clears throat> when everyone else except Claudius has left the stage. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern exit. Polonius enters and then exits. And the king is left alone on the stage and he speaks uh, uh, his soliloquy. And here we discover, we sitting in the audience discover that Claudius is indeed guilty of the crime that the ghost charged him with. The ghost is speaking the truth concerning the murder. Claudius says, beginning at line 36, oh, my offense is rank. It smells to heaven. It hath the primal eldest curse upon it. And here the allusion is to uh, the biblical story of Cain and Abel. Uh, if you'll recall, uh, Cain was, according to uh, biblical legend according to the story in the Bible, Cain uh, was the first murderer having uh, killed his brother, Abel. It hath the primal eldest curse upon it, a brother's murder. And so we learn 
that Claudius is indeed guilty uh, of the crime. He did kill his brother while his brother the elder King Hamlet was sleeping in the garden. Claudius poured the poison in his brother's ear and murdered him. Here we discover this. <clears throat> so it isn't, uh, if you recall the three scenarios, Claudius doesn't uh, exit the stage simply because he's guilty. Yes, he is guilty, but that's not the only reason he leaves the stage. It's not the only reason he uh, arises and uh, flees the scene. And he certainly isn't innocent. So the second scenario is not correct either. It is the third scenario. And I made the argument last time that uh, Hamlet, of course, believes that Claudius, uh, 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 believes that the first scenario is what occurs, that, Ham, that Claudius exits from the stage because the mirror uh, has been held up to Claudius's nature, and Claudius suddenly realizes the the horrific nature of the crime he committed, and it's his guilt that causes him to rise and flee the scene. And most, I argued also that most audience members, in identifying with Hamlet, they see that as the scenario that that unfolds as well. And I also noted that most uh, scholars. Uh, most Shakespearean scholars and most critics also interpret uh, scenario A as the correct, uh, uh, as the reality, as what occurs. But and I, I left it for you to think to to ponder why why it is that most scholars and critics uh, imagine that scenario A is the correct scenario, and I would argue that. Uh, most of them have already read the play. And so they already know of Claudius' guilt. They've read the prayer scene. And uh, they've overlooked the beginning of the prayer scene and they focus specifically on this soliloquy here that Claudius speaks in which he uh, informs us that he is guilty of the crime. So <clears throat> they uh, too have made an error, I would argue. Some. Most critics, some critics uh, uh, do support scenario C, as I do. So we have to remember that we, we do know that Claudius is guilty, that he is a murderer, he is a fratricide. He committed fratricide, right? He killed his brother. We know this, but the only reason we know it is because Claudius tells us in a soliloquy. Shakespeare has provided us access into Claudius's brain. So we know that Claudius is guilty because of this particular soliloquy in which Claudius, remember the soliloquy is a, a theatrical convention where, where an actor alone on the stage speaks the lines aloud so that we sitting in the audience can have access to his thoughts, to his feelings, to what is motivating him to why he's behaving the way he's behaving. So Hamlet, I would argue again, cannot possibly know that Claudius is guilty. Because if you recall, I argued last time, and uh, it isn't my argument, several critics have noted that Hamlet interferes with the production of the play. He rewrites the script during the course of the performance. What was to be a play about a murder, the murder of Gonzago, Hamlet alters. He changes the script in the very middle of the performance itself. And it becomes instead not a play about a murder, not a play to catch the conscience of the king, but instead a play about revenge. Uh, a play in which uh, Hamlet, and uh, I don't think Hamlet is cognizant of the fact that he is changing the script. I don't think he's aware that he changes the script, but it does become a play about revenge. And so Claudius flees the scene because he does, yes, the, the play does work. Uh, art does uh, uh, lead to enlightenment. Claudius does feel guilty for his crime. He tells us here in these opening lines in his soliloquy. 
Uh, but he also exits the stage because, uh, as I've said, Hamlet, uh, Hamlet has threatened him. That's what he believes. So Hamlet can't know the way we can know. Hamlet can't know beyond a rational doubt. He can't know for certainty that Claudius is indeed guilty of the crime because Hamlet doesn't hear Claudius speak the soliloquy here. We do. And Claudius has committed the perfect murder, I would argue. So Hamlet doesn't have access into Claudius' thoughts here because Hamlet isn't present when Claudius speaks his soliloquy, informing us, sitting in the audience, of his guilt. Oh, my offense is rank. It smells to heaven. It hath the primal eldest curse upon it a brother's murder. And so we do know that the ghost is telling the truth when it comes to this, uh, when it, uh, concerning the murder that has occurred. But again, Hamlet can't know this. Hamlet can't know that the ghost is telling the truth, again, because of his interference. Hamlet's interference. He can't possibly know that the ghost is trustworthy. Remember that Hamlet told Horatio he would bet a thousand pounds that the ghost is telling the truth. The ghost is trustworthy. And we see here he can't possibly, Hamlet cannot know that fact either. And again, what else can we really know about this ghost? This returns us to uh, uh, the problem of the supernatural. I've got a lot of problems listed for us to discuss today. Uh, but the problem of the supernatural, and again, Shakespeare's raising this uh, question of knowing the other mind, knowing what others are thinking, what they're feeling, the difficulty, the uncertainty we have of knowing for, for uh, uh, what, what others are, are uh, uh, thinking, what their thoughts are, what their feelings are, why they're behaving the way they're behaving. This problem of the other not mind. And remember, in this play, I think Shakespeare is uh, introducing this problem with a new twist. This time, it's the problem of knowing the supernatural mind. How is one to have access if the supernatural world exists and if it's populated, uh, the supernatural realm is populated with supernatural beings such as gods and ghosts? How is it possible? How can human beings? who are part of the physical world, how can they have access into the mind of a supernatural being? We know the ghost is telling the truth with regard to the murder, but that's really all we know, isn't it? If you think about it, what else can we really know about this ghost? Could it actually, could it still be a goblin dam? Could it be a demon that's come to tempt Hamlet to murder? Remember that phrase. Remember the phrase by the ghost, murder is most foul, as in the best it is. So is, is the ghost perhaps a demon that's come and has revealed the crime to Hamlet because it wants Hamlet to kill and therefore damn Hamlet's soul, thou shalt not kill, damn his soul to an eternal hell? Is it the devil himself? Is the ghost the devil himself come to tempt Hamlet? Hamlet wonders if it might be. Remember his third soliloquy? The demon I have seen, the devil himself. Uh, can we know this? Perhaps the ghost is an emissary from the Christian God. Perhaps the Christian God is working through the ghost. And ultimately through Hamlet, perhaps the Christian God wishes to revenge uh, the elder King Hamlet's murder. And he's operating, he's working through, he's using an emissary in the form of this ghost uh, to, to uh, uh, revenge the crime. After all, uh, we find uh, throughout the Old Testament, for example, we find the Christian God working through human beings uh, in order to uh, seek revenge. So perhaps the, the ghost is an emissary, a kind of angel, if you will, 
sent by the Christian God. Perhaps the ghost is the Christian God himself. That might be possible. We recall Paul's story from A Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, where Paul believes uh, the story is surrounding Paul, is the stories of the, the, the legend goes that Paul uh, uh, believed to experience a direct revelation. He believed that he witnessed uh, uh, the Christian God himself. So what can we know? Can we even know that a supernatural realm exists? All we have is evidence of this strange being that comes before Hamlet and the guards and Horatio. What else can we possibly know? Can we know anything if the supernatural realm exists or exactly, you know, can we know if there are places within the supernatural realm? Places such as the Christian heaven or the Christian hell, can Hamlet know any of this? This is the problem of the other mind. So even though we know the problem of knowing the, the, the mind of the supernatural here in this case, so even though we know the ghost is telling the truth here, I would argue there's, I can't think of anything else we could possibly know for certainty when it comes to this supernatural being. And that's why I say Shakespeare's using the supernatural in this play uh, primarily as a kind of thought experiment. He wants to show the problems that are raised with this particular belief, with belief in a supernatural world and a belief in supernatural entities. The problem of having access of knowing how one should uh, conduct oneself in the world if one holds these particular beliefs. So this is a problem. So Claudius, <clears throat> he does feel uh, guilty and he wishes to repent. He, he wishes to beg uh, his God, the Christian God for forgiveness. He wishes to plead for mercy. So Claudius is a Christian. And at this point, Claudius gets down on his knees he gets down on his knees to pray to his God, to plead, to beg for mercy, for forgiveness. Claudius is attempting to repent here. And it's at this moment that Hamlet enters the scene. What a perfect opportunity for Hamlet. What a coincidence. What a happy, happy coincidence for Hamlet. Because here, all at once, remember Hamlet is on his way to see his mother. And instead, he comes across the king at prayer. And the king is alone. He's not protected. His guards are not with him. Claudius is all alone. He's vulnerable. And he's on his knees in prayer. And so this is the perfect moment. Remember, Hamlet believes Claudius is guilty and he believes he believes he knows this to be true for a fact. We know Claudius is guilty, but Hamlet can't know. But he believes he does know. And here, and Hamlet enters the scene and finds Claudius at prayer. And he says, I'm on page 1453. At line, uh, let's see, what line is this? It's line 73. Hamlet comes upon Claudius and he says to himself, Now might I do it, Pat. Now he is a prey. And now I'll do it. What a, this is so easy. This is, again, this is the perfect opportunity, the perfect moment for Hamlet to fulfill his mission, to take revenge, to kill his uncle, who Hamlet believes he knows to be a fact. Hamlet believes his uncle is a murderer. And now I'll do it. And you see the dash mark. He pauses. You can imagine him raising his sword, right? Now might I do it packed. Now he is a prey. And you can see him pulling out his sword and now I'll do it. And you can see him raise his sword, ready to bring it down. 
and to hack Claudius to death at last, to get his revenge, to revenge his father's murder. And he pauses, and we recall Pyrrhus, the great Greek warrior Pyrrhus, the ancient Greek warrior, who in the same position with his sword high above the, above the head of King Priam pauses. But why does Pyrrhus pause? Why does Pyrrhus pause? Because Pyrrhus hears at that instant, he hears the hideous crash. The walls of Troy come crumbling down, come crashing down. And that takes Pyrrhus's ear, causes him to pause, to hesitate. But only for a moment, he's distracted only for a moment. And as soon as the walls come crashing down, Pyrrhus brings his sword down as well. You know, that's interesting, the idea. You know, that's interesting, the idea that the walls, of course, surrounding the city, and the city is representative of civilization. You remember from A Midsummer Night's Dream, the city represents law and order, and the woods in A Midsummer Night's Dream represent a lawless kind of uh, world where there is no order, where all is chaos and confusion. But the city itself represents civilization, law, and order. And interesting that uh, Pyrrhus, an avenger, the moment that he takes action, the moment that he takes revenge is the moment the walls come of civilization. I'm saying that the walls of Troy here are symbolic of the civilized world, the protecting of the civilized world from lawlessness without. The moment that Pyrrhus brings his sword down, the walls come crashing down as well. The moment that Pyrrhus seeks vengeance is the moment that civilization's walls come crashing down. Interesting thought. Um, at any rate, Hamlet pauses as well, but Hamlet doesn't pause. He's not, remember, the classical avenger. He's not the ancient Greek warrior. He's not the ancient Roman warrior. Instead, he pauses for another reason. He pauses not because of some external noise or external uh, interference, some external distraction. No, the problem is inside Hamlet's brain here. And now I'll do it. Pause. And so he goes to heaven. And so am I revenged. And you can see him ready to bring the sword down. And then suddenly he says, that would be scan. He has to think about this for a moment. Why? Why does he have to think? Why can't he just bring the sword down? He says, a villain kills my father. And for that, I, his sole son, do this same villain send to heaven. Claudius killed the elder King Hamlet. And we know, according to the ghost story, if we're to trust the ghost, and Hamlet trusts the ghost now, the ghost reminds us that it is currently existing in a kind of purgatorial realm where it is being punished, where, it is, where its crimes of, uh, uh, in nature, when it was living, are being pur burnt and purged away. And the ghost, remind, the ghost uh, relates to Hamlet. That's basically all he'll tell Hamlet about this purgatorial realm because he says to Hamlet that I could describe this realm to you, but you, it would be such a horrific description that you would not be able, uh, you, you would not be able to tolerate. You would not be able to, uh, you can't possibly imagine the horrors. So uh, Hamlet is, thinking, if I kill Claudius, and Hamlet uses that term villain again, Hamlet sees Claudius as a villain. It's interesting that Shakespeare doesn't paint Claudius as a villain. Yes, he's a criminal. He's committed murder. He's done bad, but he's also human, and he does here feel guilty for his crime, and he does wish to repent. He does wish to be forgiven. And, uh, but Hamlet, of course, just as Hamlet idealizes his father as a god, 
he also um, uh, here he he has a skewed view of his uncle as well, doesn't he? He sees him as a villain, as pure evil through and through. A villain kills my father, and for that I, his sole son, do this same villain send to heaven. So his father, who is, uh, according to the ghost, currently uh, his father's spirit is cur currently suffering in a purgatorial realm, perhaps purgatory itself. Uh, and if Hamlet kills Claudius at this moment, while Claudius is at prayer asking for forgiveness, the chance there's a chance, a possibility that Claudius will ascend into heaven, will be forgiven because he did repent. He did ask for forgiveness. Um, he wanted to atone for his crime. And uh, Hamlet says why this is higher in salary, not revenge. This is not revenge. This is higher in salary. It's as if Claudius had paid Hamlet, had hired him and paid him to take his life, to take Claudius' life at this moment so that Claudius could ascend into heaven, could be forgiven because he is at this moment on his knees, begging, pleading, attempting to atone for his sins, for his crime of murder. Hamlet continues, he took my father grossly, full of bread, with all his crimes broad blown, as flush as may. So the elder King Hamlet was killed while he was sleeping. He did not have the opportunity to uh, atone for his uh, wrongdoings while he was alive. So he, uh, he did not receive, if you will, absolution. And so this is, this could be the reason why he's in this purgatorial state. And how his audit stands, who knows, save heaven. Just how, what the situation is with regard to his father's, Hamlet's father's spirit. No one can know. Only, only the Christian God can know. But in our circumstance and course of thought, from our perspective here on earth, from Hamlet's perspective, from the Christian's perspective, but in our circumstance and course of thought, tis heavy with him. His father's spirit is in dire straits. He's in deep trouble. Tis heavy with him. And am I then revenged to take him? Now he's referring to Claudius. And am I then revenged? A question of revenge. And am I then revenged to take him in the purging of his soul when he is fit and seasoned for his passage? Because Claudius is in the process of purging his soul of all of his sins, all of his mortal sins, all of his crimes. And now if he does so, if he truly repents, he will be forgiven and therefore he will, he will actually uh, uh, be ready to ascend into the Christian heaven. When he is fit and seasoned for his passage, no. And it says, no, this is not revenge. This is higher in salary. And this is an interesting, uh, critics have noticed that uh, Hamlet here is appealing to the law of retaliation. Uh, it's the idea that uh, the punishment should fit the crime that's been committed both in degree and in kind. So since Hamlet's father, father was murdered without uh, uh, the opportunity to ask for forgiveness for all the crimes that he committed while on earth, all the sins that he was responsible for, that Claudius as well should be killed without having that opportunity. The, the, the punishment should fit the crime, the crime that's been committed. Claudius has committed the crime of murder. Uh, Claudius should be punished for that. And Claudius killed the elder King Hamlet when the king was sleeping. So the king had not the opportunity to be absolved for his crimes, for his sins, for his wrongdoings. So Claudius should not have that same opportunity either. This is the law of retaliation. You may have, you may know it as uh, 
the, from, from the Bible, uh, from Exodus, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. The law of retaliation. And critics have noticed that this is what Hamlet is thinking of. This is what comes in. This is what uh, arises. This thought comes to him, arises up in his brain, in consciousness, in his consciousness here. And uh, it does really ask the question, doesn't it, uh, this uh, uh, problem of revenge here? Hamlet says, no. No, he will not take Claudius' life at this moment because he's worried, he's concerned that Claudius would be ultimately rewarded, would ascend into heaven because here he is, Claudius on his knees. He is showing he's a man of faith and he's asking for forgiveness. Um, and Hamlet says, no, no, he won't do that. And the question is, is Hamlet freely choosing uh, here not to kill Claudius? So it brings up this problem again of free will, which I've got listed here on the board, and also the problem itself of revenge. Uh, first, the problem of free will. And again, remember we've discussed this problem uh, uh, before uh, when we were uh, analyzing A Midsummer Night's Dream. And we talked about a number of problems that are raised for people who hold this belief in free will. And the first, of course, is the definition of uh, the word free. And the second, and we discussed this in detail, so I won't repeat it here. You can simply uh, look at one of the earlier lectures. Uh, and we also talked about the scientific uh, argument and the philosophical uh, proof beyond a rational doubt, the scientific evidence that we have and the philosophical truth we derive from that scientific evidence, from the scientific experiences from uh, experiments, from the observations we've made, that uh, we are living in a deterministic universe. So you've got the realistic argument for a deterministic universe, which contradicts this notion that human beings are somehow separate from the great machine, the great mechanical process that is the universe. Remember the universe, everything in the universe can be reduced to uh, space and energy bits and matter bits, and energy bits and matter bits don't have free will. But anyway, I won't go into uh, great detail there either. We've talked about this before as well. Um, but there's another problem uh, concerning this uh, belief in free will. And this time it's a problem for the romantic. Well, the other problems are problems for the romantic, but this time is specifically for the Christian uh, romantic. Uh, because remember, Hamlet believes in a Christian God, and he believes he knows uh, certain things about this God. He knows this God's primary characteristics. The God is male. The Christian God is male. Uh, and he also believes, Hamlet believes, he knows secondary traits that this Christian God holds. Specifically, uh, that the God is all-knowing. That's one of the secondary traits secondary features, characteristics that the Christian God possesses, that the Christian God is all-knowing. The Christian God knows in advance what will happen in the world. He knows the future. He can see the future. He is an all-knowing God. And so that, that, that uh, creates a problem, doesn't it, for the Christian who holds that belief, for Hamlet here. It looks as if Hamlet is freely choosing not to kill the king here. I would argue uh, that there are deterministic factors here as well. <clears throat> this, this thought of the law of retaliation, this is something that he's learned uh, uh, in his, uh, throughout the experience of his life, the experiences in his life. This is something that he's acquired, something that he's learned. As are all these beliefs, these, all of these beliefs, he's been raised to, to be a Christian. But the problem that it raises here uh, concerning free will is if the Christian God knows the future, then human beings can't possibly have free will. The Christian, uh, the romantic, 
Hamlet can't possibly be free here at this moment because will Hamlet, should Hamlet revenge his father's murder at this moment or not revenge his father's murder? Will he revenge his father's mur murder or not? It looks as if he's free to choose, but Hamlet believes in an, in an all-knowing God. So the God already knows of those two options, which one Hamlet will pick, which one he will choose. If Hamlet uh, can't possibly do otherwise, because if you have the two options, yes, I will revenge my father's death, my father's murder at this moment, right now, option A, or no, I will wait till an opportune moment when Claudius is in the process of committing some sinful act. So I will wait, option B. Hamlet pauses. The Christian God, being all-knowing, knows exactly before Hamlet even makes the decision what Hamlet will do. From Hamlet's perspective, it can only look as if he's free. But he can't choose option A. He can't at this moment, bring the sword down if there exists an all-knowing God who knows that he will not bring the sword down at this moment before him. It's impossible. There is no way that Hamlet can choose option A. To do so would mean that the Christian God was not all-knowing. To do so would also, if the Christian God uh, would also Remember, the Christian God, Hamlet believes the Christian God is also all-powerful. It would also thwart, interfere with the God's will or desire. But this problem of an all-knowing deity, uh, it raises this uh, conflict. The idea that uh, this uh, a contradiction arises here, doesn't it? That Hamlet can't possibly be free to choose uh, if uh, this supernatural entity exist, an all-knowing supernatural entity. At any rate, he says, no, no, up sword, and know thou a more horrid hint. Wait, he's telling his sword to wait, and let's wait until Claudius is in the process of doing something, something bad, right? committing some sort of crime or sin. Hamlet gives a list here next of all the possible things Claudius might, uh, all, the, all the possible times that Claudius would be apt uh, for Hamlet to kill Claudius. When he is drunk, when Claudius is drunk, asleep, just as his father was asleep, and therefore unable to uh, be absolved of his sins, or in his rage, Claudius is in his rage or in the incestuous pleasure of his bed. And there again, we see once again, uh, Hamlet fixated. Hamlet really is obsessed with this image of his mother in bed with Claudius, this incestuous relationship that she's engaging in. We'll talk about more uh, his fixation on his mother's, the, the incestuous nature of his mother's marriage in the next lecture at game of swearing, when he's gambling and swearing, or about some act that has no relish of salvation in it. So doing something, something evil, something wicked, committing some sort of foul deed or crime. And that's the moment that Hamlet wants to take revenge because the law of retaliation at that moment, right, Claudius' soul will be damned. Remember, unlike Pyrrhus, Pyrrhus has to, Pyrrhus, the ancient Greek warrior, he has only to worry about the physical body, only Priam's physical body. But Hamlet is a much trickier situation. Hamlet, as a romantic, as a Christian specifically, he believes in a soul. So it isn't just about killing Claudius' physical body. Hamlet wants to damn his soul as well, Claudius' soul as well. This non-physical, this immaterial uh, entity, separate and distinct from the physical body. 
Hamlet holds this belief. He believes that souls exist. He's been raised to believe this, as he, that has no relish of salvation in it. Then trip him, that his heels may kick at heaven, and that his soul may be as damned and black as hell whereto it goes. These are really, uh, you can see, Hamlet himself, just thinking about it, just savoring the moment, just imagining taking Claudius, killing Claudius, revenging his father's moment, murder at a moment when Claudius is, in, is uh, uh, committing some awful, hideous crime. And you can see Hamlet is really enjoying this particular moment, thinking about it, thinking about this. And so this is another cause, a deterministic feature for Hamlet's delay. His particular belief system, his belief in souls and heavens and hells. And uh, his uh, uh, desire for revenge. All of this causes him to delay, his desire, his desire for the law of retaliation. All of this will cause him to delay here, to not take this moment, take this opportunity and actually uh, uh, murder, kill Claudius. Um, if it had been Paris, if it had been an ancient Greek or ancient warrior, a classical, war, uh, a classical avenger, the play would end here. The play would be over, but not for Hamlet, because of Hamlet's particular beliefs, the experiences that he, he has had in life that have led to his beliefs, the culture in which he's been raised. Remember, he's been raised in a predominantly Christian culture. Because of how he's been programmed, uh, he delays here. It's determined because of his uh, particular programming. And uh, it also, this also, this, this scene also, it's a very complex scene, isn't it? It also raises this question of revenge. Is revenge the uh, correct action to take? And it's a problem for uh, Hamlet, uh, although Hamlet, I would argue, is unaware of it. It's operating at the subconscious level once again. But it is a problem for the romantic, for the Christian romantic, this idea of should one revenge or not revenge. Because, as I mentioned earlier, the Old Testament, and the, remember the Bible is the uh, religious text that uh, traditional Christianity upholds, subscribes to, uh, Orthodox Christianity believes that the Bible is the word of the Christian God. Uh, we've discussed the problems with that particular belief. So again, I won't go into those details here. But the Bible, as I was saying, the Bible in the Old Testament uh, in Exodus uh, presents the law of retaliation, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth which contradicts many of the sayings of uh, uh, the Christian God of the New Testament. So you have an Old and a New Testament uh, that uh, the two Testaments together comprise the uh, religious text, the Christian text, and it's called the Bible. And the New Testament, the God of the New Testament, uh, commands uh, his followers to love the enemy, to turn the other cheek, to forgive the trespassers. So you can see a contradiction between these laws. Should one revenge? Is the law an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth? Remember the God of the Old Testament says that he is a vengeful God. Should one do as the God does? To be perfect, remember the New Testament says to be perfect is to, to be perfect is to be like your heavenly father who is perfect. So does one, does Hamlet, should he do as the God says or should he do as the God does? I remind you once again that uh, the Old Testament is filled with stories of the Christian God working uh, through 
uh, human beings, operating through human beings or through supernatural entities like angels, for example, uh, seeking uh, vengeance because he is, according to the Old Testament, he is a God of vengeance. Even the God of the New Testament says that on Judgment Day, he will come with a sword. So which is it? Is it thou shalt not kill? Or is it an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth? You can see the contradictions inherent, intrinsic here. Uh, the contradictions within the Christian text itself. Which is it? And it brings up the problem of revenge. And I would say that... Uh, the rational man would uh, would know the answer when it comes to revenge. The answer is revenge is wrong. And uh, you can simply base that on the scientific evidence that we've discussed before. This idea of uh, harming someone uh, unnecessarily is wrong. And it's only one's psychological desire and need to hurt someone who's uh, hurt uh, him or her. This is why people uh, seek revenge. But uh, a society, a civilized society, of course, uh, shuns revenge, this idea of revenge. We have a prison system, for example, and we punish people, but why do we punish them? Uh, we punish them for, first of all, to protect ourselves. If someone commits a crime, we have to remove that person from society because that person is dangerous. So it's the idea of punishment is not about revenge, it's about protection. And it's also about deterrence. We want to deter that particular individual from committing the crime again or committing other crimes. So by punishment, we hope to deter by punishing the person. We hope to deter that person, that particular individual who's committed the crime, from on being released from committing the crime again or committing other crimes. So we need this reward and punishment system. And most important, I would argue, uh, we punish uh, wrongdoers because it acts as a deterrent for other people in society. They see that if, if they commit a crime, that they too will be punished. So punishment, the idea behind punishment is not, we're not seeking vengeance, we're not seeking revenge. We don't wish to hurt or to harm that person in degree and kind. It's not of the law of retaliation handed down by some moral authority. Instead, it's a code of principles that we develop by reasoning. The idea of causing someone pain and harm and suffering I mean, that's an irrational, to do that would be uh, to think irrationally because we know that uh, brains in these states of pain and harm and suffering, that that is in and of itself bad. And it doesn't matter whose brain is in pain. It's still a bad thing for a brain to be in pain. And we know this because from our own experiences, You've got the scientific evidence. You've got the scientific proof. All the experiences that you've had in life, the times that you were in pain, that you were suffering, whether it be whether it was physical, some sort of physical uh, uh, harm, or some sort of psychological pain or torment, you know that it's bad. You know you wanted to avoid it, to escape it. So we have the scientific proof from our own personal experience. And there's no reason to think that other human beings, other feeling organisms, not just human beings, but other feeling organisms, there's no reason to think that other organisms with brains that are sentient, that are conscious, they have brains, they can feel that their brains aren't doing exactly what your brain is doing, what my brain is doing. There's no reason to believe that their brains aren't functioning just the way, the same way as our brains are functioning. We have the evidence to see it, and it would be an insult to our intelligence to believe 
that it wasn't true. I mean, beyond a rational doubt, other brains, when they're in, uh, the other brains are doing the same thing that our brains are doing. They're trying to escape harm. They don't like these states of dissatisfaction, of need or want or pain or harm. So the very idea of revenge itself is irrational. And it's also unethical, isn't it? Because you wouldn't want someone to torture you. You wouldn't enjoy that. That would not be a pleasurable experience for you. No, it would be a painful experience. So logically, knowing that other brains are operating, they're functioning just as your brain is functioning, why do you think it would be permissible to cause other people tor to torture others, to harm others? to cause them pain and suffering. So the realist would argue that revenge is not an answer. It's not a solution. One doesn't even have to weigh, the, should one revenge or should one not revenge? That we punish people, even in a deterministic universe, we still have to punish people. It's not a perfect world. This idea of punishment, it's not a perfect solution. But what other choice do we have? We have to punish people. We have to protect ourselves from harm. We have to try to deter people who commit harm. And we have to try to deter other people from committing harm as well. It's the only choice we have. But it certainly isn't, uh, uh, we certainly don't uh, create a prison system to torture people. We just don't do that. A civilized uh, 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 society doesn't do that. It doesn't torture, it doesn't harm. It's rational. <clears throat> it's logical. And another thing too, that's very important when it comes to punishment is that uh, the punishment has to be visible. People have to see that others are punished when they commit crimes when they harm, when they harm others. It has to be visible to everyone. Everyone has to see it. And also, it's most effective if the, the punishment is swift, if it's immediate. I mean, the more time that passes between the crime and the punishment, the less effective the punishment, uh, the, the less effective uh, protecting others and deterring others and deterring that criminal him or herself, the less effective uh, it becomes, it all becomes. Which raises this problem of hell, doesn't it? Remember, Hamlet is a Christian and he believes, he, he holds this belief in a place called hell, a, 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 a Christian hell, a place of eternal torture, of eternal suffering. This is where he wants Claudius' soul, Claudius' spirit, uh, he wants Claudius' spirit to suffer for all eternity in hell. And you can see the problems with this particular belief because it is a place of revenge. It isn't visible to anyone here on earth. If it exists, it's certainly not visible. So uh, it's not particularly effective in that sense. And uh, many times it's, uh, the punishment isn't immediate, it isn't swift. So again, uh, it's uh, not effective also in, in that respect. But the very uh, notion that there is a place where there are souls that are being tortured. And again, don't ask me how a soul, a non-physical entity without a brain can be tortured. I can't answer that question. Uh, a realist can't answer that question. I don't know if a romantic could answer that question, but, but romantics uh, who subscribe to this particular belief, they hold that a spirit, a soul can be tortured in a realm of, of fire and brimstone. Uh, and, uh, We've, I've explained, of course, uh, the realist would argue that revenge itself is irrational and unethical. So such a place uh, would be irrational.
uh, to create such a place would be an irrational act. And to actually uh, condemn, to damn souls to such a place for all eternity where they are suffering all kinds of horrors that would be uh, unethical. Um, and so that, again, okay, that in turn raises this problem, the concept of heaven, because uh, it's hard to imagine an intelligent being that could uh, be contented and happy living in a, a paradise, be in a state of eternal bliss and joy, knowing that such a place as a hell exists. No one irrational, I mean, no one rational, the realist would argue that no one rational could uh, be happy and contented knowing that there were other beings, other souls uh, who were eternally damned and uh, being eternally uh, tormented. That would be, no intelligent being could, uh, would wish to uh, subscribe to that, that, uh, uh, that, uh, particular circumstance would wish to that would wish for that particular circumstance to actually exist uh, or you could also think uh, you know imagine a soul living in eternal bliss in the Christian heaven uh, and knowing that there were conscious sentient human beings as well as all of the other conscious sentient species on the planet that were presently suffering in some in unimaginable ways. I mean, how could a rational, ethical, morally decent, uh, ethically decent person uh, or soul be contented? Accept that. While being in a state of bliss, all of this would be occurring. Remember Hamlet in the opening act to Horatio, he tells Horatio when they first meet that I... Uh, I would rather see my worst enemy in heaven, he says, Hamlet tells Horatio. I would rather I'd seen my worst enemy in heaven than to uh, have uh, had my father die. You know, that's rather a frightening statement. He would prefer that his worst enemy be in hell, suffering for all eternity. You can see how uh, Hamlet, uh, his thoughts are irrational. And, uh, well, it's not a, a, a rational uh, uh, belief he's holding there. He would rather his worst enemy be in heaven. Uh, so... So here, Hamlet says no. He would rather wait till a moment that's more fitting so that he can damn Claudius' soul for all eternity. That Claudius' soul may be as damned and black as hell, where to it goes. And so Hamlet puts the sword away and exits the stage to visit his mother. And it's at this moment that the king rises at the end of the scene and uh, says these words. He says, the king Claudius rises. My words fly up his prayers, his prayers for forgiveness. My words fly up. They ascend into heaven. They ascend to his God, the Christian God. My words fly up. My thoughts remain below his thoughts, his desires. Words without thoughts never to heaven go. So he's simply speaking, he's simply praying, he's simply saying the words, but he's not really wishing to repent. Or he's wishing to repent, but he can't. He knows that he can't repent. He can't truly he can't truly, he can't give up what he has, what he's gained. He can't give up the crown 
He can't give up his power. He's become addicted to it. He needs it. And as long as he still desires power, then he's not truly repentant. And he can't give up his queen. Which suggests that he cares for Gertrude. He cares for Gertrude. Of course, you can call it love. We've seen the problems with that emotion. But he desires Gertrude. He wants Gertrude and he can't give her up either. So his desires, they got him caught. He's trapped. They've trapped him here. And so his words, his prayers fly up to heaven, but they don't have any effect, any power to save his soul. Claudius too, remember, believes he has a soul. And some critics, many critics point out the irony here. They say, look, the irony, ah, Hamlet could have taken this moment. He could have taken this opportunity. He could have revenged himself. He could have revenged his father's death here because Claudius only appeared to be repenting of his crimes, but he truly, he's not a sincere, he's not a genuine uh, penitent here. Um, and uh, I don't see the irony here because of the problems I've just addressed, the problems with revenge. I don't see the irony uh, that it would have been better if Hamlet had taken Claudius's life here. I don't see the irony. I don't think a realist would see the irony in these words here. That, that uh, what a, you know, Hamlet missed his chance after all. That, uh, he could have taken revenge here. No, I think the rational man, the rational woman, the rational individual, the ethical individual would say, no, revenge is not the answer. It's not the solution. It's allowing our desires again so, uh, our psychology to trump our ability to be reasonable, to think logically, to think sensibly. Um, some critics have also noted that Hamlet does know that Claudius is guilty because Claudius is down on his knees and praying to his God. So why else would he be at prayer if he weren't guilty of this? But they forget, I would argue that these scholars, these critics forget that Hamlet has threatened Claudius. Um, and uh, Hamlet doesn't have access to Claudius's brain. Hamlet can't know why, for certain, why Claudius is at prayer. Uh, we can speculate uh, uh, that, uh, well, we know why Claudius is at prayer. He is asking for uh, mercy. But I mean, there are so many other reasons why he could be at prayer. Uh, for all we know, he could be, he could have been praying. If we hadn't had access to Claudius's brain here, to his thoughts, he could have been praying for Hamlet's soul because he believes Hamlet has, has uh, you know, uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps it's uh, Claudius uh, believes Hamlet to have uh, become insane and he's praying for, for Hamlet praying for the Christian God to forgive Hamlet of his sins and his trespasses. So uh, there could be any number of reasons why Claudius is on his knees here in that prayer. Uh, again, we don't, uh, the only reason we know is because Shakespeare very cleverly has allowed us into Claudius's head. And I think he does this again intentionally to show that we can know Hamlet only assumes he knows, but he can't know. It's an assumption. And uh, he thinks, Hamlet thinks it's the truth. Hamlet thinks he has an accurate picture, model of reality here, but he doesn't. He can't. Uh, uh, let's see. Yeah. And that brings up uh, the last problem here, and it's a problem for Hamlet. It's the problem of uh, intelligence, isn't it? Uh, I've made the argument that uh, 
the road to intelligence. It's uh, not particularly long. You can travel it in one semester. You can, uh, you know, using your brain, using uh, being rational, you can uh, add one. You can collect the scientific data and determine the truths, the philosophical truths from that data, the most important truths, what is of most value in the world. You can uh, add it up rather easily. It's no more difficult, as I said, than one plus one equals two. But uh, it's extremely difficult for some people. It's difficult for Hamlet. Hamlet is a romantic, and he does subscribe to these particular views. He does believe in a supernatural world and in a supernatural deity. And he does believe that he has the freedom to choose. Right? The whole concept of sin is based on this notion of free will. Without free will, there can really be no, the idea of being rewarded and punished eternally in heaven and hell. The whole, the whole house of cards comes crashing down if one isn't responsible here. Uh, why, if one isn't responsible, uh, should one be eternally tortured in a place called hell? If one makes the wrong decisions, if one commits what Hamlet calls a sin, what uh, being a Christian, what Orthodox Christianity calls a sin. So Hamlet believes in this idea of free will. He believes in revenge. He believes it's the right course of action here, at least at the conscious level he does. And he believes in these supernatural places called heaven and hell. And so for Hamlet, that road to intelligence, though it's still short, that first step is the big step. I would argue for many people, especially for romantics, I would argue that that first step, that's the hard step. The road is rather short, but that first step, holding these particular sets of beliefs that uh, can't be rationally demonstrated beyond, a, can't be demonstrated beyond a rational doubt to be true. Um, it's as if the romantic, it's as if Hamlet's feet are stuck in the mud. They're mired in the mud, the mud of this particular belief system that he holds. And so that first step on the path towards intelligence is extremely difficult for him because he can't think beyond how he's been raised to think. He believes he holds. Though he's struggling, he's trying. He wants to, to be rational, I think. He wants to philosophize. He wants to understand what's true, what's important, what has value. I think he desires this. I think that's a good desire. But ultimately, his particular belief system does keep him mired and stuck in the mud. He is mired deep and... Uh, that's the first step toward intelligence. The first step toward intelligence is to find out what is corrupting your intelligence. You've got to clear the attic out. The realist would argue you got to clear the cobwebs out of the attic of your brain first. You've got to see what is corrupting your potential to be rational. What is preventing you from thinking sensibly and logically? And those cobwebs have to be cleared out. I'm mixing metaphors here, aren't I? You've got to clear the cobwebs out of the brain of your attic before you can get those feet out of the mud and get on that short path, uh, relatively, relatively easy path to walk. You just have to know a few of the scientific facts and a few of the philosophical uh, truths that are derived from those facts. But Hamlet is mired in the mud. 
his thinking is corrupted. His mind, if you recall the ghost, to paraphrase the ghost words in the, the meeting, his, the ghost meeting with Hamlet, his mind is tainted. And in the very next scene, in the last two acts of the play, we're going to see Hamlet. Uh, we're going to see him sinking into that mire, into that mud, sinking deeper and deeper into it. And he's going to begin to pull everyone around him, everyone, all the characters, all the other major characters in the play, as Hamlet begins to sink into the mire, Hamlet is going to begin to pull all those around him into the mud with him. And this play will end tragically because Hamlet cannot escape this deterministic prison that he finds himself in. Be gone.